Truth Espresso, episode 69. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Well, hey there, friends. Thank you for tuning in. This is Daniel Minnick, the host of the Truth Espresso podcast. Welcome. We are continuing a series of episodes talking about the theories behind overpopulation. Is the world going to experience too many human beings? And are human beings going to suffer and starve and die because there are too many of them competing for too few resources? Now, that was the fears in the 1960s and 70s, and there are still people today who fear that that will happen in 2020. But there are other ideas of population growth that we should consider. Especially as Christians, we should think about what is God's design for humanity. Remember that Genesis 1, 28 told us that we should be fruitful and multiply. The same thing God told Noah after the flood, after God wiped out a population because they did not obey his law. He gave the command to the survivors, Noah and their family, the righteous people, be fruitful and multiply. And we see that children are an heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward, that it was a blessing in the eyes of the Israelites, according to God's law and God's design that children are a blessing and that having many children was a blessing. But things are changing in this world. The ideas of the value of life, the ideas of the preciousness of children as being someone who will carry on legacies and improve the world later. We're being reduced by people thinking that children are nothing but burdens now and will be burdens to future generations, competing for more resources or competing for depleted resources. But against the population alarmists, we should take a look, a serious look, at a model of population growth that seems to be getting more attention, that seems to be getting more adherence. And that is what is called the Demographic Transition Model, DTM for short. And I will provide links in the show notes from where I was getting information about this model, the Demographic Transition Model. And it is really based on statistical research begun way back in 1929, actually, by a Warren Thompson, a certain American demographer. And he took data from about the past 200 years and looked at birth rates and death rates and the transitions of lifestyles. And he came up with a model that had four stages that showed as human life progressed and advanced that different things would happen, both with birth rates and in death rates. And that as population grows, it really shouldn't be the alarm that Paul Ehrlich or even Thanos from the Avengers thinks, but that there is a natural pattern to things. And although population does grow after a while significantly, there are real factors that naturally would lead to a leveling off. So let's look at these stages, and as the years have progressed since Warren Thompson's original research and model in 1929, some stages have been added. But let's look at these stages and see how does population grow, and really what happens once population grows really fast. Does it just keep on growing really fast, or do certain natural 
economic factors, factors of advancement, factors of human action naturally lead to a tapering off without coercion, without sterilization, without doing things with the water, without infinity stones in a glove to erase people. So, stage one of the demographic transition model is really the first stage in human economics in various nations where you have high birth rates coupled with high death rates. And this is because until things have advanced, until research and invention, industrialization and technology has ever happened, there are very low standards of living among most of the people of a nation or of the world at large. So, because of a low standard of living and lifespans are rather short because of various things like diseases or being overworked, There is a necessary idea about trying to have as many children as you can. And because, especially as a family, if you live on a farm and you're trying to work the land, many hands make light work. And so you have children who can then share in the labor and (gasps) child labor. Yes, but basically with stage one, either you have child labor or everyone dies. Child labor in stage one is expected and only natural, and starvation for a family can be only one bad harvest away. Think of it, any kind of plague or the locusts or even bad storms, too much heat, uh, depending on where you live, the cold... Just any kind of natural disaster or a fire caused by lightning striking dead grass could cause lots of the fruits of your labor literally to be destroyed. And so if you can't produce enough to store up for the winter, then starvation is very real. And so, people in stage one of the demographic transition, many children might not even make it to adulthood. Any adults who are still living relatively healthy have to count their blessings. They are really lucky, as it were, and so there's a need to have as many children as you can, and unfortunately, even the mothers in stage one recognize that there are many complications with birth, and they could possibly end up being casualties as they're giving birth, but this is normal for people in stage one. They're well aware of these phenomena. So, for the sake of survival or passing on a legacy, people in stage one would have maybe six to ten children, and maybe only half of them would survive. And even of those who survive, just like any of the adults, their life expectancy might be 40 to 50 years old. So, I don't think any of us here would really relish the idea of living in stage one of this demographic transition. High birth rates are met with high death rates, and so the population remains relatively stable in stage one. Maybe, if people are lucky, population very slowly grows, but If you're looking at a logarithmic curve, this is a curve that very much hugs the bottom of the graph. Now, think of Thomas Malthus that we mentioned two episodes ago. His followers, the Malthusians, might think that a higher population leads to poverty. But, you know, if you understand from this demographic transition model, the truth is that poverty ultimately plants the seeds as people have to work under the conditions of poverty. People struggle then to plant the seeds for faster population growth as things get better in future stages so that there are more survivals. So, to recap, stage one, low standards of living, high birth rates, coupled with high death rates. Now let's move on to stage two. In stage two, you still have the inertia of high birth rates. And of course, there is a reason for that. You still need large families to work the land. 
Now, this stage two might have been around the start of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, as an example. So, you still have lots of children being born. You still have large families because there are still a large portion of people who live on farms, but then there are also families that move to the cities and to work in the factories that are now being created to create various goods. And there are improvements to health care being discovered. And so there are still high birth rates, but the death rates are starting to decline. Birth rates are still high, but improvements in economic output start to increase lifespans and reduce death rates. Industrialization starts to lead to lower costs of and availability of essential goods and services. And also there are improvements in sanitation discoveries that will reduce the impact of fatal diseases. And so people just learning how to wash their hands properly with soap and water, or if there are any kind of surgeries... Instead of infecting people with diseases, you practice proper sanitation and people are spared, getting mysterious deaths. And so lifespans improve, deaths start to decline, but people are still having lots of children. And so you start to see a rapid increase in the population. And so life is still difficult. Yes, but it's getting better in stage two, and child labor still naturally remains. But let's think about factory work compared to the farm. If you happen to have a lot of good years and God blesses your crops, you can be wealthy indeed living on a farm. But for those who don't want to take the risk of being one bad harvest away from starvation, it's better to go move to the city and do some backbreaking labor and get wages. And of course, you know, there were children who would work in the factories and the children would earn some money too. And we might decry that. Of course, none of us would want to live in this kind of situation in the early Industrial Revolution with children working in dangerous mines. We understand that. I'm not saying that that's a wonderful thing, but we can't dismiss the idea that due to the living conditions and the technology of the time, parents were not being evil by unnecessarily expecting their children to go work. This was the idea that that if they didn't work, they wouldn't have much money to be able to provide for the needs of the whole family. And so it was necessary for children to work in a factory. And yes, these were very difficult circumstances, but it was still better for some families to have to work hard and try to save up what they could manage to set aside and have the whole family have a means of survival as they had access to better health care in the cities and some of the cheaper goods that were being produced in the cities that was still better for them than the risk of a whole family or much of the family dying off in a famine. This livelihood was stable. This livelihood was difficult, but it was certainly more stable. And so that's stage two. So now, let's move on from stage two, which was higher birth rates and a declining death rate, leading to a population explosion. And now we move to stage three, where birth rates start to decline. They start to level off. And death rates are going down even more. So what characterizes the economy in stage three of the demographic transition model? Well, there's a higher availability and higher access to education and specialization in the market. So you have a lot more job opportunities that have specialized skills. And so you have things like going to college, getting a college major in some kind of specialized field such as optometry or family practitioner or brain surgeon. 
There's so many different types of jobs in a stage three economy that now there's more opportunities for education. And since there are higher wages from all these specialized jobs, you start to form, you start to create, and you start to grow a larger middle class in the economy. And because there are all these opportunities for career advancement, and specialized careers, more and more people start to get married or have children later in their life after they have achieved some career goals. And a greater proportion of women now in stage three, instead of having to just bear children and be at home and teach their children, more women are going into fields of education and finding a vocation there. And that also naturally leads to fewer children being born earlier in life. And so stage three, there's more economic advancement because of the population experience explosion of stage two and the technological advancement makes life easier and more opportunities, more career options available, more reasons to seek specialized careers rather than just having to do backbreaking labor to survive. And so birth rates naturally start to level off, while death rates, because of improved living conditions, start to decline even more than in stage two. So that was stage three, and now let's move on to stage four. So stage four, we see birth rates are getting lower, and death rates are also getting lower. After industrialization, highly technologically advanced society emerged with computers and microcomputers. And so we could be in the United States, according to this model, in stage four. So there's a much more division of labor that allows efficient output of resources, greater productivity, and a lower cost of living. And living as a single person is now much easier in stage four. Back in an earlier stage, it might be economically advantageous to get married and have children to help out with the labor. But now, in stage four, it's perfectly viable, given the opportunities of education, given the ability to learn skills and the lower cost of living, someone can much more easily live as a single person, support themselves, even help out other people, and not have a necessity to get married or have children. And as large city populations grow... The rate of population growth in those large cities decline because consider that there are still people who live in more rural areas. There are a higher percentage of people who live in rural areas or farming areas have more kids than those who live in larger crowded cities. So when you live in a city and you have lots of neighbors right next door, you live in apartments, you live in condos there's a natural disincentive to have lots of children in a crowded area. And so as the people move to the cities and the population in those cities grew, as more productivity allowed longer lifespans, there was also the natural disincentive to have lots of children, first because of the lack of need to have lots of children for survival, and because of more goals in life, more more career goals, more leisure, more abilities for vacations and traveling and seeing the world, there's a natural disincentive there. As an economy becomes more productive and more choices of things are now available, costs come down as competition increases. And as the economic need for having many children goes down, couples naturally have fewer children. And now longer lifespans and fewer births lead to an aging population. 
And then what about health issues? Well, what once in an earlier stage was the health issue of malnutrition, now there's more health problems that are related to obesity and people have to figure out exercise routines and diet plans rather than figuring out how to get the next meal. And so the problem becomes more of factoring things into your busy lifestyle But there's also more leisure. There's also otherwise higher quality of life than in stage one, stage two. And there's more sanitation. And so I'm not knocking the health issues in this stage. This is just a natural result of the fact that food is readily available to pretty much everyone in stage four. But stage four, because of the natural disincentives of the need to have many children, birth rates start to get lower. And so although the population is still growing, it's not growing at as fast a rate. Now, there's still lots of people being born because the population spike earlier on in stage two and three means that there are more people to have children, but the rate of growth declines in stage four. And now, recent demographers have been working on the demographic transition model, and they've recognized a a potential stage five. There are some who have even added a stage six. But what characterizes stage five that's more like a look at the future rather than stage four that might look at the present? Now, some people imagine that China might be in stage five, but stage five is not really formalized or agreed upon. But let's look at a potential idea of a stage five. So in stage five, birth rates start to decline even more. There are lots of people who are so affixated on enjoying the world and the wealth around them that they look at children as just something that you have when you're either set for life and you're ready to have children because you can bear the expense and you've saved up for it or you've done all the traveling and things you need and finally you're ready to settle down or whatever but birth rates in stage five decline even more Now, death rates are still low, but death rates might start to increase, but just naturally because of the lingering, growing elderly population dying naturally at the end of their long lives. But as fewer children are being born, and then you have a shift in the demographics where there's a much smaller population of younger people having to work to pay for the health care of the larger aging elderly population that's going to impose a greater burden on the younger people. So in stage five, you still have lots of technology. None of that's really gotten destroyed unless some large object from outside the earth comes crashing down and smashes Google supercomputers or something like that. There's no reason to expect that all the technology has gone. But, you know, if you have fewer human minds and fewer young people to work and produce, and yet technological advancements have made life expectancy even longer, the demographics shift in favor of lots of older people still being alive from stage four. But stage five introduces relatively fewer young people. And of course, unfortunately, as people have misunderstood the alleged need for stronger central governments and alleged social safety nets that really are monopolies, it's not like the only way you can have social safety nets is by having the government manage one specific one that everyone has to pay for and there's no competition, there's no innovation on creating free market social safety nets, the social safety net and the care for the elderly in stage five gets more expensive. And so stage five is something that's not really set in stone. It's something that's still arguably defined, but it is an outlook on the future. 
So the future could have its difficulties, and who knows what the future has to bring? Who knows if the Lord tarries what is in store for us in the next several generations? Who knows if technological development will make caring for an aging population easy enough because there's all this fear of robots taking over people's jobs? But either way, it's possible that things might start to get a little more difficult for the few children that people are birthing today and what will be even fewer potentially in the future. Now, there are people, notable people, who actually look at a stage five defined this way as an actual problem that the world could face rather soon. In a Wired article, I found that there's an article entitled, The World Might Actually Run Out of People. And this article is an interview with two authors of a book entitled, Empty Planet, The Shock of Global Population Decline, by Canadian journalist John Ibbotson and political scientist Daryl Bricker. Now, these two study the numbers in this book, and they predict that the declining birth rates and the changing ideas about the value of children in present economies, in general, will lead to a potential population implosion. So, in the Wired article, Mr. Brooker says, quote, If you dig in and see that there isn't going to be a lot of growth of young people coming into the population, a lot of growth is actually going to come from older people hanging around longer because we're getting better every day at keeping them alive. How does this affect transit decisions in New York City, or how governments support rural communities that are collapsing at an enormous rate right now? All those decisions are based on having a correct understanding of what our societies will look like in the future, unquote. And so, Empty Planet looks at a world that possibly within the next hundred years or shorter, the population could start to decline rapidly. But of course, as Christians who value human life, we could look at things from the light of God's word. And as Christians who value human life, who against the world's philosophies have children and proportionately might have more children than people who either fear overpopulation or are too consumed with their own comfort and lifestyle that they either put off children or maybe eventually have one child, like the One Planet, One Child campaign, Who knows, what if our world is going to become a little more Christian, at least (laughs) proportionately, within the next hundred years if the Lord tarries? So what are our concerns about population growth or decline as Christians? What is it that destroys people? Is it too many people fighting for too few resources and causing starvation? Or is it breaking God's design? Now, as I've looked at the demographic transition model from various sources, one of the factors that they seem to present constantly is the idea of contraceptives that limit human birth. And of course, by contraceptives, most people link in abortifacients with contraceptives. Now, what does the Bible have to say about things like this? Well, Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And so, as Christians, we don't look at things like reproduction and childbirth as an issue of some grand scale of, Are there too many people? Or even, are there too few people? No, we look at things such as God's institution of marriage and the blessing of children, and we don't kill children. We don't seek things that would kill children in the womb, regardless of what the alarmists say, regardless of the world's idea about the value of human life, whether the population is growing or declining. 
Even Thomas Malthus, who came up with that overpopulation theory in 1798 or earlier, even Thomas Malthus professed to be a Christian and he suggested as solutions that marriage be postponed or that people consider celibacy as a remedy for his theory of population growth. So even Thomas Malthus wasn't suggesting killing people or like Thanos or Hitler or accessing contraceptives or abortifacients. No, his solution was at least he tried to respect life. At least he was trying to do the best he could with his false idea. And at least he wasn't proposing abortion. He figured that people should voluntarily postpone marriage or live celibate lives. Well, yes, of course, because contraceptives weren't as available at that time, but there were some that were available. But contraceptives, such as things that would potentially cause abortions, should not be something that Christians should have as a goal either for themselves or for the world. And what causes judgment on a nation? Is it being overcrowded? Or is it the fact that God rules a nation and when you break his laws, God will judge? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 18 verses 7 through 10. God says, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So the issue is not overpopulation, my friends, my Christian friends. The issue is always about whether we obey or disobey God. God can bless 11 billion people. Or God can bless one billion people, as in ages past. Blessing and cursing comes whether you embrace or you break and try to destroy God's design for humanity. But now let's consider this. There are people on the political left who decades ago possibly would have joined the population alarmists. But there are people who do criticize the overpopulation alarmism. It doesn't have the fangs that it once did during the 1960s and 70s. And so it's fashionable, for the most part, from people in many plots on the political spectrum to criticize overpopulation. We realize, given the trends, that Ehrlich was wrong And there are plenty of people on the political left who would agree with that. But the reason that a lot of people in the left now criticize the overpopulation alarmists is that they got the problem wrong. They would say that the real problem is not the total population itself, but rather the distribution of wealth across the population. So, according to many people now, as Marxism has started to creep in and take over a lot of things, the real problem is supposedly income inequality. So, it's not as if the earth is getting too many people, according to the now fashionable Marxist socialist ways of thinking. It's whether the population that is there has an equal distribution of income or resources. So the real problem, my friends, according to fashionable opinion now, is income inequality. That's the real problem to overcome. So let's deal with that in the next episode. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. 
If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.